I'd like to introduce the crew. Uh, on my left, Lieutenant Colonel Eileen Kidd Collins, United States Air Force, uh, and she was a real pleasure to work with over the past year and a half. I hope to work with her in a, again in the near future, uh, and it was great flying with her. Uh, it was her expertise that uh, enabled us to hit the timing task to the exact second. She was giving the guidance commands. She was the poli police woman during the rendezvous, making sure that we were doing everything according to schedule. Uh, and she performed all of the burns on the, on the Spartan uh, retrieval. Uh, she went to Syracuse University in 1978, graduated with a math and economics major, has a master's degree from uh, Stanford and Webster. Uh, she flew C-141s in the Air Force and was a professor of math at the Air Force Academy. The kid was not a rookie when the SRBs ignited. She was right there with us as a, as a veteran. She's the perfect choice for American's first woman pilot in space. Uh, on her left, Dr. Bernard Harris uh, pulled together all of the science for me on this flight. He was my payload commander, and it was his expertise that enabled us to uh, reprioritize and, and replan and get all the extra experiments from Space Hab 4 combined into Space Hab 3. Uh, he went to the University of Houston, 1978, graduated with a biology degree, has a doctorate in medicine from Texas Tech, did his residency work at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, worked at NASA Ames. He's uh, on four faculty appointments. He flew an STS-55 on Columbia. He has great bedside manner, but I'm not going to let him take any more blood from me. Uh, Dr. C. Michael Fall, Esquire, from Cambridge, England. Uh, before the flight, I said he had the unofficial title of World's Smartest Man. I saw a lot of the world, and uh, I'd like to upgrade that to the official title. He is the World's Smartest Man, at least of the world that I could see. He's a computer whiz from the University of Cambridge, has a PhD in astrophysics, I worked at NASA's Mission Control Center before joining the astronaut office. Uh, he flew on STS-45 and STS-56. Uh, Johann Kepler never guided 100-ton vehicles together in space, and he has. <laughs> Dr. Janice Voss, uh, MS3 from Rockford, Illinois, uh, did a superb job on the arm during the, the uh, grapple of Spartan. Uh, she went to Purdue University, has a PhD in, uh, MIT, from MIT in astronautics, co opt here at JSC also, uh, and she flew an STS-57. Uh, she's a commander's dream. She just went up there and did every job that she was given, did it expertly, uh, and, and was a pleasure to fly with, and I hope to fly with her again. I hope to fly with all of them again. <laughs> My very good friend, C Colonel Vladimir Georgievich Titov from Russia. Vladimir Krovny, he's uh, very cool. If you've seen uh, the, uh, his second launch attempt, you'll know what I'm talking about. You should have seen him on the arm during this flight. I, I said pre-flight that we were going to watch him. We did, and we did learn a lot about space flight from Vladimir. Uh, he was very cool on the arm. He waved the folks around on the, on the end of the arm and did an outstanding job. We would like to roll the movie, uh, and after the movie, we'll show our slides. Of course, the toughest part about training is uh, designing the patch, and once you do that, then you're ready to go fly. <laughs> Here we are on suit up morning, uh, putting on the ACES suit. Uh, four of us had the new suit. It's a, a very good design. Worked very well if we ever need it uh, for depressurization sy system. Uh, I'm sure it's going to work uh, very well. We also had the liquid cooling garment, which kept us very cool on ascent and, and during the entry. That's a, also a new improvement. Many people helped us over the year uh, getting ready to go launch into space, and it was great when we walked out uh, to see some of the smiling faces of the folks that have helped us over the uh, previous year and a half, and it was nice to, to wave at them and, and give them a smile as we departed for the launch pad. Of course, as you approach, it's the first time you've seen the, the launch pad when, when there aren't very many people around. This is a moment that takes me back to when I was about six years old and uh, I first decided I wanted to be an astronaut. And this is looking up at your rocket and uh, this sends shivers down my spine every time I think about it. And it was a special feeling as we went up the elevator. The main engines ignite uh, six seconds prior to liftoff and then of course the SRBs ignite. When you see the launch from a distance uh, in person or on cameras, it looks like the vehicle is climbing very slowly and stately. Uh, we are here to assure you that there's nothing slow about it. It's uh, <laughs> power and speed are the two words that come to mind. Uh, when the SRBs ignite, it's a pretty rough ride. A lot of vibration, shaking going on. Um, 
of course, 7 million pounds of thrust, uh, and you can feel every one of those pounds. The first uh, rendezvous maneuver is done uh, right here on the launch pad. We wait until the launch pad is in plane with the mirror, and then we quickly launch. Uh, that occurred uh, shortly after midnight, and so it was a night launch. Pretty exciting going uphill. Uh, I especially like the, uh, the view uh, that we see after we land. It was great seeing the view in the cockpit, but of course we're working the systems and making sure everything is working. SRB separate and we're on our way. Once we get on orbit, um, we have a nice exterior look of the space hab, which is the module has all the experiments, in fact, 23 different experiments. Here you see myself, and uh, the LOJ has a camera uh, as we open the hatch to space hab. Uh, the investigations included a variety of things, from crystal growth to plant growth. Uh, we even uh, did uh, uh, the famous taste test that you heard about. <laughs> The experiments on board pretty much ran the entire complement of the kinds of experiments we do in space. This is a protein crystal growth experiment that uses a vapor diffusion apparatus. These trays are full of little vials of protein crystals dissolved in a solution. You pull the trays out, you can see the little chambers, little round circles in the center of the screen. Each one has a little droplet that contains the solution. And during the flight, these droplets, the half moon shapes you see, evaporate, leaving the protein crystal behind. And hopefully, they get very large crystals from this experiment. We also had some other life sciences experiments on board. Back in the module, this is Vladimir <coughs> Titov working on the astroculture experiment, growing plants in a, the sort of equipment that hopefully we can use on space station in the future to grow things for astronauts to eat. This is a robot we had on board called Charlotte. You can see at the bottom right corner of the screen a cable. There are eight cables like that attached to the corners of Charlotte, which allows it to fly around like Charlotte in Charlotte's Web. It can turn switches, as you see it during, doing here. It can punch buttons. It has a camera. This view is from the camera on board Charlotte, so it can send pictures to the ground of how the experiments are performing in space, so it can be used to work experiments when a crew member is not available. What you're about to see here is the Odorax deploy. Uh, three spheres and three dipoles were launched. There goes one, another sphere, and a dipole. The, the purpose of this was to uh, calibrate the ground radars so in the future they can better track orbital debris. You all know about our jet problem. Uh, we worked this pretty hard the first couple days of the flight. We thought we were going to go into 33 feet. Um, here, you, okay, there's the oxidizer spewing out. And you can see this very well at the Terminator passes. But we thought we were going to go into 33 feet, but with the leaking jet, we knew that there'd be possibility we'd be limited to 400 feet or maybe even 1,000 feet. Uh, first, uh, first time we saw the station approximately 50 uh, miles uh, from us. Uh, and we received, uh, uh, in this time, we received a message from Station Mir uh, about uh, we have a decision about 30 feet approach. This is the first time when we've been able to show you how dramatic the speed looks on orbit. We're traveling at over five miles a second. It's the first time we've had other human beings and another spacecraft able to take our picture. We fly underneath the mirror slightly faster and then climb up in front of mirror co-altitude where we eventually slow down and fly co-speed. We fly the first third of the rendezvous from the front part of the cockpit just like they do on the Enterprise. Uh, you do all the burns uh, with the computers, computer guided and, and automatically controlled. And then we fly to the, or float to the back of the, the vehicle, turn around, look uh, aft and, and fly the remaining portion of it manually. This is Valery uh, Polyakov. He's the cosmonaut who's been up there over a year now and will soon uh, set a record. Uh, this is Elena Kondakova uh, speaking to us on the shuttle. In fact, all the astronauts got a chance to uh, speak on our VHF radio uh, to the cosmonauts on Mir. It was very motivating. As Jim climbed up towards the, the V-bar, that's basically the horizontal line uh, tangent to the Earth where we're going to meet up with Mir. I was ranging with the laser, and meanwhile, they were looking at us coming up. And this is something we only saw when we came back, and we appreciate how dramatic it is. In fact, what you're seeing here is sped up uh, twice normal speed, just so that we can uh, show it quickly. But I think even so, you can feel how, uh, how dramatic that is. In the foreground there, you see the, the, the uh, dark metal ring. That's a, uh, an adapter on the mirror for uh, scientific instruments. And then at the bottom right, that's a scientific instrument. I think it's a telescope.
Once we were at about 400 feet, um, Jim arrested the approach to the mirror, and uh, we basically station kept there for a few minutes before we started our timed approach. Once that time came up, uh, we basically had a, a, a window to make, and uh, Eileen kept us straight. Uh, we were flying uh, range rate commands using another laser tracking system, the trajectory control sensor, um, in the middle of the bay, ranging off the docking port here, which is the White Cross. And Jim will tell you what he's doing there. This is a view taken from one of the payload bay cameras, and it, it shows how stable the orbiter is as it approaches to the target. And very few inputs were required. Uh, we saw no motion from the solar rays. You see the solar rays slewing. We were in the low Z mode, essentially not pluming the station. Uh, we, of course, didn't want to damage something this beautiful. Uh, and again, you can see how precise the orbiter is. We didn't do very much. It just stayed in the right place. It's a little bit easier to fly than the simulators, and that's good. This is the view out of the window at uh, about 37 feet. And you can see Vladimir and I are both um, crashing into each other, trying to get as good a shot as the other. <laughs> this is a pan that Vladimir made. Um, and you can see the windows. There's Elena Kondakova with her knee. Yes, Elena Kondakova and me. We wave each other and for you, of course. Uh, I don't know who was it. Uh, this uh, somebody know a new <laughs> on board station. This is Valery Polikov, and this is Commander uh, uh, Alexander Viktorenko. All of the time with the camera and uh, uh, show the movie, make movie. This is uh, uh, his uh, picture from Station Mir. Again, it shows how well the vehicle has been designed. Uh, after we. Uh, remained at our closest point of approach uh, for about 10 minutes with the, the, my uh, crew members helping me to make sure that we didn't go one inch closer than the flight rule limit of 10 meters. You can see the solar array slewing. Again, no motion at all from our jets. We saw no uh, interaction. After 10 minutes, we backed away. Uh, and proceeded out to 450 feet and initiated a fly around as, as a photo survey. In fact, this is one of the harder things for uh, Jim and I to sort of talk about in the cockpit. As we backed away, Mira maneuvered uh, so that we no longer had a center line towards the uh, docking port. And at 450 feet, we started to climb up above it and behind it uh, in our orbit plane so that we would do a full circle around it, basically trying to stay at 450 feet. During this time, however, using the laser, which was the handheld laser, which is the thing that a traffic cop would use to catch you for speeding, um, we basically couldn't find many reflective items on the mirror to get a range off. And so uh, we basically had to move out a little bit further than we first planned because of that uncertainty. But it was no problem, I think, for Jim. If anyone has any doubts about what we're doing in the future, uh, let us assure you that we are on the right track. You, you can't help but see a vehicle like this that's been up since 1986. It's just stunning, just breathtaking, and, and it, it really tells us that we're doing the right thing. We had met the Russian people before we launched, and they're very proud of their space program. They know a lot about our space program, and we, of course, are very proud of our space program. Uh, and it's time to join our forces and make both of our programs better. This is what 17,500 miles per hour looks like from the top. We have payload bay lights on board the shuttle that help illuminate the mirror. We could see it at 600 feet. And you'll see in the next shot, if you watch the top upper right corner of the screen, You'll see the jets on the mirror firing. We can see this, all the structure and things very clearly at night without any help. Look up right up in there, top right corner. What's going on there is it's de-state, it's, um, they have gyroscopes basically on the mirror to give it attitude control and at some point they become saturated and then they fire jets to uh, desaturate the gyros. And this is our parting shot. And it was a pretty sad moment, I think. We'd had a long day, it was busy, but one of the most exciting days in my life, I must say. The second major activity we had on this flight was the Spartan satellite. It had an ultraviolet telescope that's on the right side of the box, the gold box you saw in that picture. On flight day two, we took it out of its station in the payload bay to look at the shuttle. 
It's looking at the ultraviolet glow on the surface of the tail of the shuttle. Vladimir Titov, you can see at the controls on the robot arm here, he's flying the Spartan up above the nose of the shuttle so it can look back at the tail and at jets on the tail to fire and watch their glow. On flight day five, we released Spartan so it could go look at some stellar objects. Again, Vladimir Titov is flying the arm here. We let the Spartan go and then we watch it to make sure its attitude control system is working properly. When that's all been checked out, Jim flies the shuttle away at about one foot per second, which allows Spartan to drift about 40 miles in front of the shuttle where it can perform its observations undisturbed by the shuttle environment. The ultraviolet uh, telescope will be looking at diffuse nebula and other intergalactic objects which can't be easily observed from the ground. You can see us doing ranging marks and looking at the Spartan to make sure all the deploy is going well. You see it in the center of the screen, that little black square is Spartan on its way. This is Mike and I preparing for uh, our big event, at least it was my favorite thing on the mission, and that was the EVA. Uh, we have to pump the suits up uh, without anybody's in it to make sure it's not leaking and then uh, get uh, ready for prep. Here I'm attaching electrodes to my chest. Both Bernard and I wore these during the EVA it's so that our flight surgeons can monitor our heartbeats during the spacewalk. And here we are getting ready for our uh, four hour hang on the wall while we uh, get to look at each other and uh, tell each other stories. After they waved goodbye to us, we had to get right back on getting Spartan retrieved. Jim was flying the rendezvous here, and you can see Spartan coming up. The robot arm is in the bottom center of the screen. I'm performing the retrieve at this point. I'm using the camera on the robot arm, which is the view that you see here, to get a good eye on how Spartan is coming close. That's me at the robot arm. You see the trajectory at the bottom right corner of the screen there. That's the approach that we flew. The part I'm trying to grab is actually the bottom center of the screen. I'm using the target in the middle of the screen in order to aim and adjust my attitude properly so I can get a hold of Spartan. That all went very smoothly. Job did a, Jim did a superb job of setting me up for this grapple. Once we got a hold of Spartan, we then put it back in the payload bay. There had been some concern before the flight because earlier flights had had some problems with the latching mechanism. They had changed the hardware before this flight, and we were hoping it all went well, and indeed it did. It went right down into the guides and latched up on the first attempt, which was good news for the EVA guys champing at the bit to get out in the payload bay. And champing we were. Bernard and I kept on looking at each other as the RMS slowly did its thing. <laughs> but here we are. We got outside. We were very happy. We waved to the camera and started our thermal evaluation. Well, I was the first guy on the arm. I got in with no problem. You see the arm is outfitted with a pad. And uh, once I got it safely in, I grabbed a hold to Mike. And by the way, we're, we are tethered. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Veloji lifted us both up about 30 feet above the, the cargo bay for the coal soak. And during this time frame, actually, neither Bernard nor myself felt particularly cold anywhere. It was only when we started to unberth the Spartan and we moved into darkness at the same time. Here you see me on the end of the RMS, uh, moving it a little bit closer to Bernard so he can grab a hold of it with a small handing tool and perform his uh, mass handing evaluation. During this time, I had full control. Once Mike handed it off to me, it was my job to take this almost 3,000 pound object satellite and wave it back and forth in the air. I only weigh about 250 pounds, and, or 205 pounds, I should say. <laughs> He's getting lighter Thank all the time. God, I don't weigh 250 pounds. They wouldn't let me go in the shuttle. So it was a, it's not as an easy task as you may think. Uh, even though it didn't weigh anything, it does have a lot of mass. And uh, you can see here my initial starts and stops. I did not have the, uh, the satellite very square, and it was sort of a steep learning curve uh, at the very beginning. After a while, I got the hang of it, and uh, then it became uh, pretty, pretty easy. But the only way you can move masses like this is very, very slowly. I must say, Bernard did it extremely well. Initially, he said he had a, a lot of concern about doing it even slower than we had practiced on the air bearing floor. But uh, as far as I could tell, he moved it without uh, cross coupling anything uh, towards the end of his mass handling evaluation. I was steadily getting cold while watching him, and so we ended up uh, berthing the Spartan because of specifically very cold hands on my part, and I think Bernard had cold feet. After we'd been told to do the, uh, the berth, Bernard was able to practice his thermal mittens evaluation. Uh, after I did that, then it was uh, Mike's turn on the RMS. He, uh, he had been up there uh, freezing his toes and hands off at this point. 
and uh, he did actually did a close pass over an IMAX camera that we had in the payload bay, so you'll see some nice footage of that later. One of the things we do on every flight is look out the windows and take pictures for Earth observations folks. One of our important jobs in the space program is to monitor the Earth's environment. You can see glaciers here in the southern Andes, Patagonia area. It's an area that we don't see very often on shuttle flights because we don't go to the high inclination that we had. We were at 51.6 degrees. This kind of terrain is of very interest to the Russian co-investigators on this flight because of the glaciers and watching the water runoff. But we do eventually have to come home. Ours was an eight-day flight. Morning of flight day nine, we packed up to go home. We had one last chance to say goodbye to the Mir space station. You'll see it in the center of this frame, and then you'll see a meteorite go by. Shuttle has a unique experience of having meteorites go below it. If you think ascent is exciting or the Mir rendezvous is exciting, uh, you wouldn't believe entry. The only way to take out the energy that we have put into the vehicle on liftoff is to come slamming into the atmosphere. There are not many molecules up high, but the ones that are there are screaming hot when you hit them. And you see the pink glow outside the windows. The flash is caused by the attitude control jets uh, firing. You'll see a scene looking back aft on this 25-mile trailing plume of fire as we come flying into the atmosphere. Uh, it was pretty dramatic for us because it was a night entry. Uh, we saw the sun as we approached the hack just briefly, uh, the large turning circle. So most of the entry was at night. The sun peaked its little head above the horizon and then dipped below again as we descended in our 100-ton glider with a lift-to-drag ratio of worse than 4 to 1 and reverse flight path control. Uh, but the system is very, very smooth. You see the turbulence uh, from inside, the 20 million candle power xenon lamps down on the runway, illuminating the runway, of course, from where we were, it looked like daytime. Uh, early morning, you'll see, uh, again, a flying over the threshold of the runway, you see some of the turbulence, but the vehicle handles it very well. It takes out all of the gusts and turbulence. You see some of the trailing edge vortices coming off of the wingtips in the next shot as we roll down the runway. Eileen will deploy the drag chute, and it disreefs just prior to nose wheel touchdown, which helps to reduce the loading on the main wheels and the nose gear. See the shuttle uh, chase airplane flying by. Like I said, he could see some of the flash bulbs going off on the side. I wasn't looking in that direction. <laughs> Jim always told us not to look out the window, but I blew it. I might add that you feel quite heavy after coming back to Earth, uh, spinning over a week in zero gravity. When I took my helmet off, it felt like it weighed almost 75 pounds. <laughs> after Eileen. Uh, got rid of the drag chute was the first time we had used the brakes. The system is so good. We will uh, show our slides at this time, and then we'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, again, this is a spectacular night launch uh, with all that thrust and power underneath. Uh, the system worked very well. We had no problems until after we got in orbit, and that's a uh, testament to all the folks who worked on the, on the systems here at JSC and around the NASA uh, centers. The launch plane uh, and, and, our, and our high inclination dictate that we had only a five-minute launch window. These are the kind of things that we'll be doing every time we fly to Mir. We'll have just a five-minute launch window. Again, I'd like to thank my crew for uh, helping me on this mission. I simply uh, did what they told me to do, and the vehicle was so good that it, that it was all pretty easy. Uh, we should have no trouble in the, in the future on these missions. Again, setting up for the rendezvous, we do the first portion of it up in the front cockpit. This is the commander seat on the left. Uh, for the second rendezvous, we switched roles, and Eileen uh, took over the commander seat and did the... the I should add burn. that during this time, we were kept on trying to uh, make Jim feel better about the jet leak. This was a topic of conversation almost every night, day transition in our orbit. We'd be looking out the back window and he'd say, is it still leaking? we go, yes, Jim. And he'd try and smile. <laughs> and I guess he's trying to smile here, too. Of the 44 steering jets that we have on the orbiter, we had problems with three of them. Uh, one of them had failed off and two of them were leaking. There was a forward jet that started leaking on flight day two, and this is a procedure that I'm working here. Um, that one we were able to heal uh, 
fortunately, because it was a required jet to do the rendezvous inside of 1,000 feet. Uh, we cycled the manifold once and uh, ran this procedure. We hot fired the jet three times and we managed to heal that leak, so you probably didn't hear much about that on the ground. Um, it, and also, it, this would be a good point for me to, to mention all the great support that we got from our flight controllers and our engineers here on the ground and also the managers that worked very hard and very long hours working over in Russia with our Russian colleagues. Everybody wanted this approach to happen, um, the Russians and the Americans alike, and uh, we did everything we could. And, uh, and of course, the crew worked hard, but we have great thanks to pass on to the people here on the ground that allowed this mission to uh, go all the way into 33 feet and be a complete success. Uh, first radio contact we had uh, with station we had uh, on distance approximately 550,000 feet from the shuttle. Uh, the connection was stable, and um, the first time we saw the station when uh, it was about 50 miles from us. Before the sunset, we saw um, a bright star in the direction of our velocity vector. And first, we had a discussion on uh, if it was the planet Jupiter or station, but um, in that period of time, uh, we were um, not sure. But after the sunset, uh, the star uh, disappeared, and which means what it was a station, and we were approaching it. And uh, I uh, would be able to see my uh, space home. On this picture, you can see the station which is located about 400 feet from uh, the shuttle, be shuttle before the sunset. Uh, the final approach of 30 feet uh, started during the, this orbital night. And when we began that approach, I must say personally, uh, it was hard to realize what we were actually doing, you know, approaching the mirror. It was such a spectacular sight. And yet we had a, a pretty technical job to do at this time. And so I would concentrate with the handheld laser um, at pointing straight at the docking port, as you see it in the lower part of the scene there, and call out ranges and range rates to uh, Jim while he uh, very carefully maintained a corridor and flew it in. This is the target. You see the standoff cross in the center of the picture, uh, which we use for angular alignment and, and translational alignment. We fly the approach uh, with the attitude control system and automatic pilot, and, and we fly manually the translational control system. Again, it was very stable uh, and, and fairly easy, easy to do, even in the low Z mode, which reduces the plume on Mir. Uh, this picture is made from the distance of approximately 35 feet. Uh, in the window of station, you can see the face of Dr. Valery Polikov. Um, I had some experience working with him for four months during my year of flight. But now he got so brave that uh, he even beat uh, the record uh, of the longest space flight uh, that my flight engineer and I set it in 1988. It has just been a little over 13 months of uh, uh, him working in space nonstop. This side of uh, Mir represents uh, the eyes of the station because uh, this is the place where the main windows are located. Uh, this is the place where video equipment is located and uh, where the crew can watch the Earth. On the top of the station, in the middle, this is some top. Uh, one moment. This one. Uh, you can see a uh, green color uh, circle, but uh, like looks like a window, but it's uh, not like not window. It's this uh, hedge of the airlock with a small airlock, which the crew used for performing experience outside uh, the stating. stating. Uh, it is also used for uh, trace dis, uh, disposal if uh, it necessary. <laughs> After we had spent some time uh, close up to Mir, and uh, we talked a lot on the radio and had uh, taken many pictures, but we then had to start the second part, which was the fly around, and Jim backed away to uh, 450 feet and then st started a slow climb around the, uh, the Mir up and over it. During this time, I think uh, Janice was taking some uh, IMAX film footage. That um, IMAX film footage that Mike mentioned uh, will be ready in a couple of weeks, and it's going to be beautiful. Uh, my job during this whole uh, rendezvous was to be in the space hab with uh, cameras at both sides, firing pictures as fast as I could. We have a lot of beautiful photos. 
And I have to tell you that the, the photos don't do uh, the beauty of this station justice at all. It really is gorgeous. Uh, this is uh, the station as we're doing our separation burn and, and getting ready to leave Mir. Space Hab, as we mentioned in the film, was one of our other major activities on the flight. This is the aft port end of the Space Hab module. You can see the general setup with the lockers that contain experiments and the wall to the right of the slide that has things like procedures in our trash areas. This is uh, Vladimir Titov working on one of our life sciences experiments on board. There were a variety of different experiments, both in the module and on the mid-deck. This is an example of another class of experiments that we did, a radiation monitoring experiment that Jim, our chief scientist on board, was operating. <laughs> he loved that title. <laughs> we, made, we made Jim an honorary scientist on this flight. There were also a large number of experiments on the mid-deck. Even though they are space hab experiments, they're stowed on the mid-deck so they can have easy access for change out of chemicals right before we launch. It's much easier to get in the mid-deck than all the way back into the space hab module. And this shows a variety of different experiments. The silver boxes are refrigerators. The top center one holds a protein crystal growth experiment. The middle right one is the vapor diffusion apparatus that we saw earlier. The gold boxes in the center of the screen are accelerometers that we use to measure the environment of the space shuttle to help people better understand what kind of experiments can best be done on board. The third major area we had on board was the Spartan satellite. This was the attached ops on flight day two, where we're using the telescope that you can see on the right-hand side of the box, the gold box, to monitor the shuttle environment, the glow on the tail and the RCS jets firing. Then on flight day five, Vladimir Titov deployed Spartan. As we, you saw in the film, it drifted away for a couple of days and we went back to pick it up. This is me on the retrieve day, flight day seven, at the robot arm controls as I'm getting ready to grab a hold of Spartan and put it back in the bay for our anxiously awaiting EVA guys. My knights in white armor. <laughs> I, I mentioned in the movie that uh, Bernard and I tried to avoid looking at each other and telling each other stories because we'd already heard a lot of our stories before then. Um, in fact, for four hours, we were having to do a pre-breathe. Uh, the cabin was kept at 14.7 uh, pounds per square inch atmospheric pressure so it wouldn't disturb the experiments. And for that reason, we had to get rid of the nitrogen in our bloodstream by breathing Puro 2 for uh, four hours. It was actually not as bad as I expected. Um, you're more comfortable in space. Um, Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice that Renard tried to sleep more than I did during this period of time. Um, on, on my left arm there, I'm in the uh, lower left. On, on my left arm, there's a, a boxy looking at contraption called the electronic cuff checklist. And it's a device that basically lets us pull up with menus um, the activities we're going to perform during the EVA and also some uh, contingency procedures. And I spent my time bothering Bernard going through all of our EVA flight plan by uh, walking with that checklist. We also monitored uh, their conversation on one of our loops. This was during the Spartan retrieval, and these guys just cracked me up. <laughs> I think I talked about this on the movie. Um, when we first came out, uh, we had a major task, and that was the outfit, the RMS, with this pad, what we call pad and contraption here. Uh, there's a special uh, device which we hook to the RMS, and then we then put a, a portable foot restraint on. And then we had a thermal cube that measured ambient temperature. Uh, the objective of this, this EVA, we had several objectives, but the major objective was the thermal evaluation. And that was, we were told, go outside, guys, turn your heat all the way up and stay out there until you get cold. And uh, if you followed us, uh, we got cold fairly quickly. And that's not hard uh, to do uh, when you're facing deep space and we're talking about temperatures of uh, an excess of... 2.7 Kelvin. Mike is Holly Meyer, 2.7 Kelvin. I, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> it's very cold. But it's, it's very cold. <laughs> it's greater than... <laughs> <laughs> about 100, minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that I do understand. We have some preliminary um, um, temperatures from the sensors that we had in our gloves and uh, it shows that it was lower than 20 degrees inside our gloves in the suit, so pretty cold. This is a, a picture I tr tried to take or took with uh, the Hasselblad. Um, while I was basically floating free, Bernard had a hold of me with one hand 
Um, and it was surprisingly stable, much more stable than the water tank. I was trying to take shots one-handed with the Hasselblad, and uh, unfortunately, I got his feet. <laughs> Those are my feet, right? There. <laughs> and they're big, too. But because uh, there was a tremendous view for me and Bernard while we were doing this, particularly uh, with the earth behind Bernard. Uh, I, I will always remember this for the rest of my life, just how breathtaking that was. Because we were still in Earthlight, we were not getting as cold as we had pumped ourselves up to think we would be. And in fact, I was starting to get overconfident about this, I guess, when they thought about bringing us down at the end of this 15-minute evaluation. We both gave ratings, I think, of the order of just slightly cool or, or normal um, before we were brought down to the bay for the uh, mass handling evaluation. It was shortly after we were brought down uh, in the bay. I got off the RMS, and then Mike got into the RMS, and then you see me uh, here to the right side of, of Spartan. Uh, we had uh, foot restraints on each side of these, and those are always on the Spartan impasse uh, just in case uh, people like Janice and Velody have trouble uh, birthing it. Uh, then we could do an EVA and actually birth it. Uh, shortly after that, Mike was sort of hanging freely. Uh, we went into a night pass, and that's when it really got cold. Uh, at that point, I, was, I had the Spartan in hand and actually going through the mass handling that I described in the movie. Um, and I guess that whole sequence was around 10 or 15 minutes into the night pass uh, when we both started noticing that our fingers and feet were getting colder and colder. And uh, it's about that time that we asked Eileen to move us to a colder, a warmer attitude, that is. Uh, but in space, at night, there is no warmer attitude. <laughs> Here you see me uh, basically doing uh one of the experiments I was working on in the mid-deck, this is the solid surface combustion experiment. It's basically um, two uh, cinema, basically movie machines that uh, take pictures of a, a flame propagating acro across a solid surface. And this was a very simple experiment for me to do, appropriate to my capabilities. This is uh, an experiment. Uh, I'm not going to go into telling you exactly what it is, but look at all this contraption. Look at all this. As a medical doctor, I was glad that I wasn't the subject in this. <laughs> because it had so many wires and gadgets that I had to connect to these guys. It took a while to get them outfitted. He did it to Vladimir, too. But the yeah. good news is, while he's working madly trying to get all those wires connected, I'm just floating there having a great time. This actually, this device, in, in short, basically uh, was an um, electrobiogram, which actually placed electrodes over the muscles to uh, get an idea of how they respond to microgravity. So you can actually, if you move your arm, you can actually look at the waveform. So it's a very uh, sophisticated device, very portable. The thing that didn't show up on here is Janice is also wearing some nice little ski boots, at least that's what they look like. And these were to apply some pressure to the bottom of her feet to simulate um, uh, standing uh, on the earth. And uh, we're still waiting on the data to come back on that. Even in space, you can't get away from paperwork. <laughs> Actually, this system worked out pretty good. This is our fax machine, and uh, we call it TIPS. And every morning, uh, Mission Control would send messages up to us, mainly uh, changes to our flight plan, updates to procedures. We got messages to cheer us up. And as one example of the other types of messages we get, the Earth observation people would send us information on that day and ground scenes that we'd be passing over that they'd like to see pictures of, along with what camera and what f-stop we should use. A lot of our flight was over water, but we did get some nice shots of things over the land. This is the blue and white Niles coming together. The white Nile is the wider river to the left of the screen. And the area in the middle, all the little dark rectangles that you see in the center bottom of the screen is cotton growing areas. This is the city of Khartoum, which spans the blue Nile on the right side of the screen. And this is one of the largest cotton growing areas in the world. These glaciers were so impressive to us that we decided we'd add another uh, picture in our slideshow. Uh, you can see one uh, right here in the middle emptying into a lake and also down here in the bottom emptying into a lake. It, they actually start from an altitude of over 10,000 feet 
Again, this is uh, in Chile and Argentina, uh, South America. And if you look at the history of these areas, if you go back thousands and thousands of years, uh, the scientists tell us that these glaciers actually flowed into where the lake is, and the lakes were formed by the glaciers. And you know, flying on the shuttle and taking these pictures in both the uh, visual and infrared range, we can uh, really get a lot of information to the scientists and learn about uh, the history of our Earth. It's uh, this island uh, called the uh, Heard Island. This is approximately 51, 52 degrees south. This is maybe southern um, uh, island in the Indian Ocean. All of the time, uh, this island and the Kerguelen Island uh, under the cloudy. And uh, this picture interesting, uh, you can see uh, cloudy waves. Uh, gravity waves and the beginnings of uh, von Karman vortex uh, swirl up here in the structure cloud deck uh, downwind of the snow-caped island. And this is a picture of South Africa. Um, it looks like um, part of the, okay, now I can see. Uh, this is actually uh, Cape Town, and this is uh, Robin Island. And that island happens to be the island that Nancy Mandela was in prison for, for all those years. And uh, it really, uh, when I look at this, uh, uh, it really is a beautiful scene, uh, but also a symbol of, uh, of independence. Again, the system that we have is a very good one. Uh, you may have heard that we uh, left the system in auto. We flew such a wide hack, uh, a large uh, hack, heading alignment cone, left it in auto, and uh, it went a little bit low. As expected, we all knew it was going to happen, and, and there's, we think uh, it's a great system. Uh, on the final approach and landing, I was uh, Happy to show Vladimir how we do it. Hopefully the landing was a little bit more smooth than his previous three landings where they dropped straight down. 